everyone, welcome back to the channel. I've got here on the bench this time a Marshall Stanmore Bluetooth speaker, which is completely dead. Um, normally I don't do this type of equipment on my channel um, because it's too young. <laughs> it's not really old or vintage equipment, but um, I'm gonna have a look at this and try to repair it and I decided, well, I'm gonna make a video out of it anyway, because maybe um, someone can be can benefit from my video maybe someone has a similar uh, bluetooth speaker with a similar issue and if i manage to repair it then maybe you can use it also to repair your bluetooth speaker so yeah that's why i decided to make a video about it just to maybe help someone in the future um, if you're a regular viewer of my channel and you're more into older gear and vintage gear don't worry the next video will again be about something a bit older <laughs> Um, now this one belongs here to a friend of mine who asked if I could get a quick look at it because it's totally dead, it doesn't do anything anymore. See if I power up the, yeah, if I enable the power here and then if I turn it on, I do get a quick flash in the dim bulb. It goes up to 5 watts and then it drops to now it's 2 watts, 1.9 watts, about 2 watts and um, nothing. There is absolutely nothing, none of the LEDs light up, no buttons do anything, no sound comes out, so it's totally dead. It's only drawing one and a half watts now, so yeah, let's turn it off. I guess it's a power supply issue, which is, I've looked a bit online and it's not uncommon with these types of uh, Bluetooth speakers that they have an issue in the power supply. Um, so far. I'm actually surprised because it's um, very heavy. It looks nicely built. The grill cloth here is actual cloth like you would uh, see on a vintage guitar amplifier. It looks to be quite nice, so it would be a pity to just chunk it out. Um, let's see if we can open this thing up. Okay, so this is take two of this video. Um, I had the Bluetooth speaker fully repaired, it was fully working. I had even said goodbye, see you in the next video. Um, and then I took it off the dim bulb and it just shut off again and it broke down again. And um, totally dead again, just as it was before. Um, well, then um, I took it apart again and I noticed the fuse was blown, which was not the case before. And I found out that there were again some other components that blew. So originally I found the issue, repaired it, replaced some things, um, got it working again. And now um, there are new, uh, a new section in the power supply that blew. So different components that uh, were damaged. Um, so yeah, I had to order in new components and we are now a couple of weeks later, everything has arrived and then we're gonna try to repair it again. And I'm also going to explain you what I did before. Um, if you notice something weird in my voice, well, I've got a bit of a cold here. So, um, apologies for that. If I sound a bit weird, um, or weirder than usual. Um, the, the added value of this now is that I do know very well how to take it apart because this is going to be the third or fourth time. Um, so this is going to be uh, quite easy now and I can um, explain you very well now how to take this thing apart. Um, first of all we're going to remove the outer, uh, what is this, eight screws. So the ones here on the edge of this plate. Um, this part doesn't need to come off. Um, so just let me quickly do that. Okay, so that should loosen this back panel and we should be able to take this out now. Um, I do have some components here that blue that I took out. Um, I put them here in this Ziploc bag just so that they didn't get lost. 
Um, so what we have here is the main board. Um, almost everything is on this board. So the power supply, amplifier, the Bluetooth, everything. The only thing, there is still a second board here on top and that's for the controls. All the rest is here on this board. So if you're not used to working on electronics, um, two warnings. One, this is going to be quite a difficult repair. Um, I found it a very difficult PCB power supply to work on to the way it's made. We'll look into that later. Um, it's not an easy repair. And second, uh, we're going to be working on the power supply. So uh, we will be, uh, well, there are parts here in the power supply that are exposed to uh, line voltage. So high voltage. Uh, be careful because these voltages are obviously dangerous. Um, it's uh, just the yeah, mains voltage. Uh, so also this capacitor holds up quite a bit of a charge. So if you have plugged in the um, the speaker before, uh, make sure that this one is discharged while working on uh, on this thing. Um, it's a 150 microfarad capacitor at 400 volts. So it's gonna um, hurt quite a bit if you um, short that out with your fingers. So first thing we're gonna do is disconnect all these connectors. This is the incoming uh, voltage, the mains voltage. Um, these are the speakers and I think this is the left and right tweeter, I think. Um, this is, I believe, the main, uh, the base speaker. Um, this connector, this ribbon cable is going to the control panel. And then here, I think we have something Bluetooth related. Maybe for the LEDs, for the Bluetooth, I don't know. Anyway, this one also needs to come off. Okay, now getting this PCB loose is not that difficult. I'll show you what we need to disconnect here. So first thing we're going to do is um, disconnect this screw and uh, nut here that holds these two transistors against the back panel. And that is this screw over here. We're going to take that off and we need something to hold this nut in place while doing that. And that's a five and a half millimeter nut. See, so I'm just gonna show you clearly which screws I'm taking out and which ones I'm leaving in. Well, this is actually not really a screw, it's a bolt, but okay. And everything is falling out now. So these transistors, they are held in, held down or pushed down via two uh, pieces of, well, PCB material that are keeping the screws down. And then you have two washers and a nut uh, on the top to clamp it down. Let's put this aside. Um, <clears throat> Next, the things we're going to loosen are these. Let me see if I'm doing the correct thing here. Yeah, these two guys over here, these two, and that one to loosen the uh, the connector. Basically, we're going to loosen all the screws except the ones here on the uh, power connector. So these are the ones that hold the heatsink in place. But it's best to remove the screws from the back panel and just keep the heatsink attached to the PCB. This one here holds the, uh, the connectors in place. The RCA jacks. And then we're going to start loosening the screws that actually hold the PCB itself in place. And um, about the power supply section, um, I have been searching online uh, quite a bit and I found in the meantime two forum posts on two different forums uh, discussing this exact uh, speaker. 
and um, it seems that a lot of people get issues with the power supply even though um, well uh, the issues are quite different basically everything in the power supply can go wrong some people have issues with a certain part some people have issues with other parts um, one forum that I found was in French I believe um, the other forum was in English. I can post the links to these forum uh, threads in the description. And this one is not coming out. Or is, is it? Yeah. Oh, this one is... Um, yeah, I need to, I need to hold it um, because it is um, turning loose. Um, it's not staying in place. Um, but what, what did I want to say now? Um, yeah, so I found a couple of forum posts. I also found someone who completely drew the schematics of the power supply section of this uh, PCB, which is very interesting. Um, I can show it on the screen. It's a hand-drawn schematic of um, the power supply section. It's very convenient. It can uh, help you quite a quite quite well when uh, repairing this PCB. Um, normally everything should be loose. Well, ah, yes, indeed. Um, over here, let's see, um, you have some foam which is glued on the back of the PCB. Now here it's gonna come off quite easily because I've already loosened it before but if you uh, cannot get this to loosen drip a bit of isopropyl alcohol here on the on the foam um, and then um, pinch it off with a with a sharp blade or a, um, a spudger or something like that then it should come off. See now it has even settled again because it's been sitting a couple of weeks and I did remove all the screws, right? Yes, there it comes off, see? So it's this part of foam which is glued against uh, the back panel. Okay, so we have the PCB out. That's already something. Let me put the cabinet aside here for a minute. Um, now while we're working at this, it's quite annoying that we have here this um, thermal paste on there. Um, I might wipe it off. It's thermal paste that I applied. So there was originally thermal paste which was dried up a bit and then I thought I fixed the, the, the damn thing and I applied some new thermal paste but uh, just gonna wipe it off because if you're handling this PCB thermal paste get everywhere on your bench and on your fingers. It's quite annoying. Okay. Now let me explain you what I already did and what I am still going to do. Okay, so it seems to me that quite a bit of issues are um, related to this area of the power supply section over here. Um, and that's also where I located some uh, issues that I, thought, that, I, that I thought I fixed and then it was working again and then after a while it, uh, things blew up again. So um, let me first explain you the first diagnostics that I did. So here in this section over here, so these three capacitors, they were held in place with a blob of this um, black stuff, this goo or uh, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's a bit silicone and it's used as a glue here to help or to keep components in place. It's super annoying because it's really difficult to remove. And uh, this PCB was clearly clearly not designed with repairability in mind because this gun goes all over some of the components and some components are placed in awkward positions so you need to take other components out before you can reach them. It's a mess. It really is a mess and it's difficult to work on. It's incredibly annoying to work on this, PC this PCB. So I first I started measuring components and checking things and I couldn't really find some I an issue at first sight. I did read online that a lot of people were having issue with this capacitor that is a 3.3 micro microfarad capacitor. Um, it's C4. Um, so I replaced that one. That didn't help. But 
hey, anyway, I was going to replace it because I heard that on a lot of um, examples of this device, this one goes bad. So I replaced it. Um, but here there was a thick goo uh, here between these capacitors. And then when I cleaned up that goo, I noticed that there were two components located underneath. See, I think you can see the places where they were. They are removed now because I replaced them in a, on the bottom side of the board. But um, see, you have here a... There was one Zener diode and one resistor, I believe. Yeah, there was one resistor and one Zener diode um, underneath here. Um, so if you have a piece of gunk sitting here, be aware that there are two uh, very small SMD components sitting underneath. I found out that this uh, Zener diode was shorted. So that one was gone and that was my issue at first. Um, so I, um, I replaced the Zener and the resistor because when cleaning up this area, this resistor also broke off because it's a very small SMD component. And I replaced the resistor on the back. See over here, it's not in shot, sorry. Let me turn this around. See, so there I, uh, and let me focus as well. See, so there I replaced this resistor by, with a normal type resistor. And then um, I, I'm just going to also put on screen here the, uh, the schematic that this guy has drawn. And then I will highlight the components that I'm talking about. So this resistor was replaced. And here I replaced the Zener, but I don't know the original value of the Zener that was in there because it was broken and I don't have a parts list. I read on one of the forums that it should be between 20 to 25 volts. So I um, created here three Zeners in series, which should in total achieve a Zener voltage of 24.6. Um, I had 6.2 volt Zeners in stock. I obviously didn't have anything between 20 and 25 volt, So I just put uh, three uh, 6.2 volt Zeners in series and um, heat shrink those and then solder these to the parts where this original Zener was present. And that actually fixed the issue. But then as I explained, things went very wrong again. And then this fuse blew. The fuse was originally not blowing. I started troubleshooting again and then I noticed at second side, so in the in the second um, troubleshooting session, I noticed that um, there is a MOSFET over there, and that one was now totally shorted. Uh, let me. That's this guy. See, I took it out, um, and that was originally an. Let me see if I can read it. It's an um, FDPF. Forty and sixty NZ. So that one uh, was gone, totally shorted, and I tried to. Well, it took me quite a while to find a um, a suitable replacement for that. But I have all the replacement components in stock, so um, we're gonna replace that one. And um, I also, well, depending on the schematic and on what I read online. I'm also going to replace this IC because I think, I suspect that this IC is also bad. And I even suspect that this is the main issue, this IC, and that this one is causing all the havoc and all the issues. Um, when troubleshooting further, I caused some issues as well. See here, there is um, a capacitor and another Zener diode that I lifted out to check if those were the problems because I could still see a short here in this circuit. Um, but they were perfectly fine. I have them here in the back, but they are so minute that it will be very difficult to place them back. See, that's the uh, capacitor and that's the, uh, the Zener diode. So those are still okay. The Zener diode I'll probably be able to put back, but the capacitor is super tiny. Um, here you have an opto coupler. I also lifted that one out of the board to check if it was fine. It's still fine. 
it didn't uh, solve the short that I have here in this circuit. But yeah, I broke one of the pins when putting it, uh, when taking it out. So I'm also going to replace. In short, I'm going to rebuild this entire section here. So I'm going to replace this um, uh, MOSFET. I'm going to replace these two capacitors, that opto coupler, that resistor. Uh, sorry, that capacitor and that zener over there, and then that IC. Um, so we're going to have quite a bit of work cut out here. The big issue here is that it's very difficult to reach that MOSFET because it is um, screwed in from this side and this big capacitor is in the way and you it's really difficult also to remove this heat sink because it just takes so much heat from your soldering iron it's very difficult to work on this PCB okay yeah by the way um, this is the capacitor that you want to discharge if you are testing this uh, PCB or this Bluetooth speaker and you just powered it up on the on the mains, then this one holds a charge and a very big one. So this is the one that you, these are the pins that you want to discharge before working on this uh, circuit. Now the easiest way to do this according to me is simply not bother taking this um, heatsink out and just removing this capacitor because um, it, it comes out, it should come out more easily than the, than the heat sink. Maybe I can use my pump. Not easy with the camera in the way, but we'll manage. This side is clearly taking more heat. Okay, so that cap is out and the the minus is towards the edge of the board. So yeah, you can see I already removed the uh, the MOSFET a couple of weeks ago and that's uh, the, the one that I read out here. That one is totally gone. I'm going to replace it with a uh, STFU. <laughs> That's not an insult to you, it's the name of the component. Uh, STFU 10NK60Z. Um, I think that should be a drop-in equivalent if I uh, read the data sheets correctly. Um, it's an N-channel MOSFET 600 volts 10 amp. And um, yeah, picked up a couple of these because I don't know how much I will blow them how much of these I will blow out when uh, trying to prepare this board again. Now what is interesting and why I went for this is this, this is the original one and it has a uh, fully plastic packaging and this new one that I'm going to use has the same type of plastic packaging so it doesn't have a metal backplate that uh, connects to the heatsink. Um, that's why I went for, I specifically looked for something that also had a fully plastic packaging. I guess it's, um, not sure if it, if, if it is relevant in this application, but it might be that it doesn't connect to the heatsink. So I'm just going to put that one in and solder it in. So normally you should put some thermal paste behind it, but uh, I'm first going to make this thing work. Um, uh, maybe not, maybe because now I have easy access, maybe I can immediately put some thermal paste and screw this in place. 
Yeah, that's the better way to do it and hope that it doesn't blow up and then I have to redo it again. So I'm just going to put a... I hope that all this is showing up well on camera and that my camera is in focus and everything. So I'm just going to put a small dab of... Uh, I'm going to put it here. Just a very small dab of thermal paste. And then I get it all across my fingers, all over my fingers probably, while trying to fiddle this in the in the PCB. Yeah, it is in. Okay. Bit lower. And I'm immediately gonna screw it in place. Because if you do it the other way around, if you solder it in place first, uh, you might have the issue that the hole doesn't line up and then... Uh... See, even with the capacitor out, it's not easy to reach the screw. You cannot reach it straight. So uh, it's ridiculous the way that this board is made. Oops, I was out of shot there. Is it going in? Yes. Yeah, I can see the solder paste squishing a bit out on the side, so... It's in. Okay, now let's solder these pins. Maybe I need to apply some flux first. Because this PCB, I have already been soldering on it quite a bit. And um, I don't want to ruin it even further. Yeah, this middle pin is annoying because it is, I think it's connected to the heatsink and uh, it just takes so much heat. Okay. Now the fun part. Um, I'm gonna take out these two capacitors because I'm I want to swap them out anyway and then I have better access to this entire area. Um, and of course I soldered my... Ugh, I soldered my zener here to the pins of these capacitors. Ah. So this guy also with the minus towards the edge, it's a 100 microfarad at uh, 63 volts. And this one, the negative is pointing to that side, see, so the negative is here on this uh, edge. They are quite well marked on the PCB, so that's fine. Um, taking this one out. That one is a 22 microfarad at 50 volts. I am also going to take the optocoupler out. It's still fine, but I damaged one of the pins and I really don't want to risk it. This is uh, turning into a bit of a solder and chat video. But otherwise we don't have anything of content in this video because um, so far, yeah. 
I don't have a lot of success on this thing. This is really this this PCB or this uh, device is really not made with repairability in mind. It's a bit uh, a disgrace actually. But that's how it is these days. I mean, unfortunately, things are made to be assembled efficiently and uh, most manufacturers don't care anymore about reliability or well reliability okay but not uh, about uh, repairability definitely not so that's uh, yeah annoying at the least so wait uh, the pin one of the optocoupler is there see on on that corner that's the pin that is marked okay let me try this camera position um, not sure if that will help but um, it's the board is now a bit too far away from me to for comfort but okay yeah now at least the camera is not in the way anymore is it coming out Not really. Yeah, it's out. But see, I broke uh, broke off a pin and everything. It, it really, the pin, pins of this thing is are really flimsy, and it is difficult to get it out while uh, keeping it in one piece. Okay, so I decided to also remove this capacitor, so that was the good one, uh, the one that I already replaced earlier, the 3.3 microfarad, just to get easier access to this chip, and that's the one that we're going to replace. Um, now, thanks to this um, forum, I actually figured out what this chip is, because it is either not labeled, or the labeling is gone due to all the goo that was put on here. And I believe it is an OB2269, for which I also picked up a couple uh, of replacements. So, um, but hey, let's first try to get this old one off. Um, maybe apply some heat, some, well, flux first. There's also goo still on the pins, but I found out that this goo uh, comes off much easier if you, um, yeah, with heat. So if you apply a bit of heat, um, but let's first try to get this IC off. Yeah. There it is, already off. Now um, it's gonna be quite an issue or quite an, uh, an exercise to clean this area up here because it's all... Oh, okay. That's already promising. It's still quite warm, this gunk. So that's helping definitely. Maybe if I put my heat gun on 150 degrees, which I normally use for heat shrink. Let me get some isopropyl alcohol 
And I'm just gonna clean up this enti entire area over there because um, it is, well, not in the best condition. See, so there, did I lift a pad over there? Yeah, I think so. But these, oh, these are not important because these two components here, those are the one that I replaced on the back of the board. So these should be okay. But all this entire area here, in normally I didn't see anything about it. It was totally covered in gunk. Um, this transistor over here, uh, I measured it earlier and it tests quite okay. It tests okay. It's still fine. It's in uh, 2SD669. Um, and it's testing fine. See here I lifted some traces. They are still there. Um, and these two here on this side, they are connected together. So I think that should still be okay to get this working again when I replace these components. But I suggest that you just rebuild this entire area here, this one. So this chip, that uh, MOSFET, uh, these, this center here, uh, that resistor and these three capacitors. Now here are still two resistors. I think they are okay, but I, I can still measure them. I think they are fine. Now the, the problem is a lot of people don't like working on SMD and I get that. Um, I understand that this is a, a nightmare to work on for some people, but I do think that the SMD itself is not the issue. The issue is that they are manufacturing these PCBs and with layouts being so cramped, traces being tiny and um, it's, I don't think it's the technology of SMD that is the problem here. It's more the PCB design and the total lack of designing something with reliability or repairability in mind. Um, the fact that you don't have any schematics available. That's, according to me, much more of an issue than, than just the SMD technology. So these resistors are labeled, so R105. Is labeled, I have it upside down, 9.1k and this the other one is labeled, I can't really read, 24k? Let's check that. Yeah, 24k, I read it correctly and this one was 9.1k. And oh, come on. 9.1k, spot on. So these two tiny resistors are still okay. Um, maybe not a bad idea to clean up these pads of that I see a bit. Do I still have some tiny solder braid? Yeah, there. Oh, I don't have much left. And I'm making bridges between the pins. That's always nice. <clears throat> I just want to be sure that we do this first time right because, um, yeah, it's already fiddly enough to work with uh, SMD technology, then uh, it's gonna have to redo and redo and redo. It's not what we want. Okay, uh, let's do this. I'm going to use solder paste for this. If, if you don't like SMD soldering, 
or if you think it is too difficult to do, try getting into using solder paste. It makes a big difference. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it's much easier than using a solder iron to, to solder a component like this. So these are the replacement components I got. Um, I'm just gonna have to go on the pinout that is printed here on the PCB and see with the notch printed on that side because this original chip, I don't have any markings anymore on it whatsoever on what is pin one. So um, we're gonna have to assume that pin one is here on, on this side. And uh, let's just take one out. Put this on the side and now let's see if we can position this correctly. And that's not great. That should be more or less it. Okay, let's get the hot air gun out. Darn, I have a bit too much on that side. Those two pins are connected together. That side as well, I believe. Darn. I just applied a bit too much paste. <laughs> yeah, that's something that you need to, to get into and to learn what is the correct amount of paste to apply. Um, not too little, not too much, because um, see, these two pins here, they are now... They are bridged and those two there as well. So let's use the solder iron to try to fix this. Okay. That looks fine, and that's so fine as well. Um, see, so if you use uh, I, that, that means I just used a bit too much paste, so too much solder paste. Um, if I would have used just a tiny bit less, then it would have been perfect from the first try. But you can see you can easily fix it with the with the solder iron. I think that one should be okay now. Okay, so the next two components are these two over here. So that's a capacitor and that's a designer. I took them out to test them earlier, but they weren't bad. And now the issue is that I lifted here a tray. See, um, see that one? Um, so I don't know if this will work. We'll see. Now this is the designer. And uh, the problem is this is the capacitor. So this one is so tiny that I'm not gonna put that one back. I'm just gonna put a bigger capacitor in there. It's a one microfarad capacitor and um, it's just too tiny to put it back. I'm gonna use a bigger version. In any case, you can ask yourself if you're gonna have a uh, one microfarad capacitor of this size, how reliable is it gonna be? I mean, this is just ridiculous. Now I dropped it somewhere, where is it? Okay, so this is the original capacitor. That's the one that I'm going to use. This is a 1206. Uh, it still fits in perfectly on that footprint, but it's just a lot bigger and a lot easier to handle. And this is the Zener diode. So um, I'm just gonna carefully fold this transistor out of the way a bit. And let, let's put these on. I already applied the 
the solder paste and I hope that this will work with this lead uh, or this trace which is not totally perfectly connected make sure if you put in the diodes that they are facing the right direction so these that should be okay I think that's okay. Doesn't look great because this uh, trace is loose, but uh, I think they are making contact. I will just double check the connections, and uh, but I I think it's okay. Yeah, so I think it's fine. Look, these are these are both in parallel. Uh, these these center diode and this capacitor they are totally in parallel so um, see and we don't have a short between the sides that looks to be fine okay um, I think we have all the SMD components done mm, time to put the normal components back Okay, so next up is the optocoupler, and that's an EL187. I already have the new one in place, so we can solder it in. Well, I do agree that in general, the dip components are easier to um, repair or replace. But I I do think if you're into the um, so soldering with solder paste, that the uh, SMD components are easier to assemble. If you have just a clean board and you want to assemble it, it's uh, very fast and very easy. Maybe that is my thinner solder um, I'm just going to thin here the top side as well a bit um, and you're out of shot because I have been butchering this area of the circuit so bad that it wouldn't surprise me if the the true holes uh, might be not perfectly fine anymore so I'm just going to make sure that they are these legs are tint on both sides of the board probably not needed but um, I just want to rule out any issues that we got here. Okay, um, what's next? Probably should fold this transistor up again. Next is these three capacitors. That's the only things that we have still left to do. Where is my capacitor? So this is the 3.3 .3 microfarad one, which I replaced earlier. So I'm just going to put that one back. I have already cleaned the holes here for this, so it should fit in. Famous last words. Oh, yeah, it does. Okay. Okay, so um, now let me just 
clean up the remaining holes for these remaining two capacitors and find some replacement for those in my stock. Okay, so the 22 microfarad 50 volt replacement is also a 22 microfarad 50 volts. So I'm just going to solder it in. No problem. And um, this is the zener that I put in earlier and which I tacked onto that side of that capacitor to the positive side of the capacitor, yeah. So the negative of the zener goes to the positive of that capacitor and uh, I'm just going to tack it in again, probably add a bit of solder like that, tack it in. That should be fine. Snip off the leads. Okay. So, and on the other side, I'm gonna remove that side of the zener because here on this side, the positive of the zener is connected to the negative of that capacitor. So I'm just gonna lift that trace for a moment or that zener lead for a moment, clean up this pad. like that and um, originally this was a 100 yeah 100 microfarad at 63 volts i'm going to replace it with a 100 microfarad at 100 volts because that was the closest that i had in stock the capacitor is slightly taller but that shouldn't be a problem because we have Lots of space here anyway, taken up by the transformer. Putting it in like this. Okay. It's falling out slightly, but so let's do it like that. Solder it in. And then I'm going to do the same with this side of the zener. Just tack it in place. <coughs> Oops. Hot, 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 hot. Okay. Right, snip off the leads. And I think we should be done with this board. Well, I hope so, that we're not... Oh no, and still need to put this capacitor back. Um, okay. I need to clean off this pads here as well. So that's going to be a bit more difficult because they take a lot more heat. Okay, that one is open. That one is done as well. That went easier than expected. So here is the cap. I tested this one, it is still okay. Let me just show you because um, yeah, you might not believe me, right? So. This is a 150 microfarad at 400 volts. Ah, see, 134, 134 at and uh, dot three ohms ESR. That's still okay. So. We're gonna put that back. See that there's only 10% low, and um, so that is definitely within spec. Okay, like that. Oh, 
Okay. I hope we are done. At least for the moment we're done. Um, let's hook everything up again. So I still need to swap out the fuse. Um, that's the that's a 1.6 amp fuse. Uh, let me swap that out. Hook up the PCB uh, back to the speaker. And uh, let's see if we fixed it. Okay. Um, I have everything hooked up again. The speaker is connected to the dim bulb limiter. Uh, just to be safe here. Um, let's power it up and um, watch out for the um, the fuse. I replace the fuse. If that one blows immediately, then we are back to square one. I, I hope it doesn't because um, I'm really starting to run out, out of out of ideas here. If it doesn't work right now, or if it blows up again, then um, yeah, I don't know what to do anymore. Then we might have an issue with one of the transformers which would be game over for this um, yeah, speaker. But okay, let's give it a shot. And uh, it's all or nothing now, I guess. Okay, I'm just powered up the dim bulb. Let's fire up the speaker. Do I have everything corrected correctly? Yes. Let's fire it up. Okay, the dim bulb lit up very brightly for a second and then dimmed off. Um, it's drawing 9 watts, um, 70 milliamp, and it's only getting 200 volt. But uh, it is powering up. The Bluetooth LED, you cannot see this on the, on the video. Maybe over there. See that uh, the Bluetooth LED is flashing? So we do have power. That is fine. I'm just going to give it one more bulb on the dim bulb limiter um, to get it up to more than 200 volt. Um, yeah, so this is two, 238 now. And the Bluetooth LED is flashing. Um, at the moment it seems to work. Let me find a device here to hook up and to um, connect via Bluetooth. Okay, let, uh, let's have a look. I have my tablet here ready. Um, let's power this thing up again. Dumb bulb limiter and the speaker. Okay. It's still working. <laughs> um, I might have it still paired from the last time when I tried this. At least the LED is not flickering anymore. Um, yeah, it is already paired with my tablet. Let's, what is the volume? This is the volume. Let's put it a bit down. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. Ah, there it is. It's quite silent. I, is my volume not all the way up here, maybe on my tablet? Uh, that's weird. That's weird. Let's try some other video or some other piece of music. Okay, that's better. Um, I just rebooted my tablet and now everything is working fine. So I, I don't, <laughs> don't know what went wrong, but uh, yeah, now it's working fine. I'm using the aux input now. Let's switch to Bluetooth. Um, am I paired via Bluetooth? I guess I am. Let's unplug the 3.5 millimeter jack. And... Uh, Let's see if we now can get something in via Bluetooth. It's still blinking, so I don't think I'm paired. Let's try that again. Stand more speaker. Connected for media audio. That looks fine. The LED is now steady. That looks fine. And the... Uh, well, it's still super quiet via Bluetooth. 
from this tablet at least because well, I just tried it with my cell phone via Bluetooth and there it works perfectly fine. So what is going wrong here? Let's unpair. Ah, see the ringtone is working well. Oh. Ah, there it is. No idea what I did wrong. I think there was something wrong with the pairing or something, but I just unpaired the device and paired again and there it is. because the bass is way too much on a speaker like this it's uh, super boomy I don't I don't like it that way but uh Everything is holding up so far. Let me take it off the dim bulb limiter and then we see if it holds up again. Because like this it was also performing before the last, last uh, repair. But then when I took it off the dim bulb the fuse blew and uh, everything uh, went haywire again. So let me take it off the dim bulb limiter and then see uh, if everything is still going fine. Okay, it's off the dim bulb. It's directly into the wall now. And... Um I guess this is the big test. Watch the fuse. So far, so good. I'm not paired anymore, but... Uh... Ah, there it is. Well, I think we need to put it back together again, right? So I'm going to mount the PCB back onto the uh, back plate. I'm not going to show you that because it's just the reverse of what we did when we took it apart. I mean, I'm going to apply a tiny bit of new uh, thermal compound on these places. So this is where two transistors are. These two transistors are mounted to the chassis. Here there is a heatsink from underneath mounted here to the backplate. Um, so the backplate is used as a heatsink. I'm just gonna remove this and then put a couple of dabs um, new thermal paste. When you apply new thermal paste don't overdo it. Just a small dot is fine. Yeah if you really want to do this the correct way then you take a brush and you coat the heatsink here nicely and evenly with some thermal compound. Not too much, just needs to be covered. If you're gonna put too much on there, then it works. Uh, it has a, an, uh, yeah, the other effect. It has a uh, negative effect. So uh, I'm just going to coat here the backs of these transistors with some thermal compound. Oh, 
Okay, that should be enough. And now I'm just gonna screw everything back on the back plate. So there we have it and it's done um, and I do think that this is quite a nice speaker I mean it looks great sound is okay um, it's a bit boomy but then you can just turn down the bass and then it looks it still sounds pretty good it has a lot of power and there's a lot of volume that comes out definitely worth repairing because if you look at how much these types of speakers from Marshall cost uh, these days um, new um, because this particular model is not made anymore, but the follow-up models, they are still in production. And the new ones, they cost uh, easily, I think, 350 euros or something. So definitely still worth repairing. And I think it, uh, I'm quite glad that I managed to get this repaired. Um, it was a challenging repair, I have to admit. Um, but... Um, mainly because these things are not made to be repaired but hey i managed to fix it i'm happy um, now i know that this is a device that normally doesn't fit it's not really featured on my channel it does look retro but um, it's not old tech um, i still wanted to put out this video anyway because i noticed online that there are a lot of people having issues with uh, this model maybe um, watching me do it can maybe help someone uh, don't toss it away um, repair it it's definitely worth it uh, now for my regular subscribers i just want to say the next video will probably be again about some older tech so um stay tuned because uh, yeah i will get into some older uh, tech again um why it's probably why you subscribe to the channel right so um anyway i'd like to thank you for watching i'm just gonna test run this now for a week or so before it, I return it back to the owner. I'm going to use it uh, daily just to see if everything is fine, if uh, nothing goes wrong, and then it can go back to its owner, which is a friend of mine. So um, I'd like to thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.